Hi, this is Professor Cummings, and I wanted to do a brief video today talking about the, how to do basics on gearing. Now, gearing is one of the most versatile ma machine elements that you're going to be able to use, and I thought it would be a good video just to go over some of the most fundamental aspects of gearing. Now, I'm going to speak in generalities, you know, so I'm not going to get into things like helical gears or bevel gears or, you know, any herringbone gears or anything else that can get to uh, too much complexity so I'm gonna try and keep this talk pretty universal so go over some of the fundamentals of gearing you know how they're utilized what you need to take into account when you design a gearing system and you know what other aspects of what gears can actually do and from there you can you know build onto that knowledge to much more complicated gearing system so this is just the fundamentals of what gearing is. Everybody's been in a vehicle. Everybody's had to change speeds. Everybody's had to change, use the power differently. So this is some of the things that I think this particular system can demonstrate. So if you've ever been in a car, you've ever been in a pickup truck, you know, you've used your gearing system, your transmission system to do uh, three basic things. And this is what gearing systems can all, are all capable of. They're capable of changing the power, the amount of power from the input to the output are come out as a different type of torque. They're able to change speed, you know, which is the reason you go from first gear, second, third, fourth. And they can also change direction. And in this case, direction is not just going from reverse and forward, but also uh, able to utilize gearing systems that can actually go you know, 90 degrees or any number of degrees, not just linearly. So gears have a lot of ability to actually transmit and change the direction of energy and just change the nature of, of how the energy is going to be used to make it more mechanically useful for you. Now what I want to start off with is showing you this schematic of gears. So so the benefit of this this particular diagram is that it gives you some view of what all goes into gears and, and to the mechanics of the gear. So what we have here is the upper gear, you just call that the pinion. The smaller of the two is, is typically known as the pinion. So we can identify that as a P. And the lower of the two, the bigger of the two, is a gear. So that is typically identified with a G. And sometimes these are labeled A and B. Sometimes 1 and 2, are they're, they're numbered. But for all intents and purposes, we're going to say P is the pinion, G is the gear. Now, some of the more important features of the gearing system is I want to start with is the shape of the gear tooth, which is known as an involute. Now this involute, like I said, is the shape of the tooth, and it is that rounded profile of the gear tooth itself that when in mesh with the other gear, the pinion to the gear, it allows for a smoother transition of power. So it's got this radius that's designed into the tooth so that it makes contact and maintains that contact you know over a longer period of time so the transmission of the uh, the, the power of the the gear from pinion to gear or gear to pinion is smooth the gears typically won't disengage when you have an involute until the next gear has actually come into contact that's one of the reasons why it's such an important shape in the gearing uh, gearing system so that involute the next thing I wanted to talk about was the pressure angle. Now, the pressure angle is one of the things that people typically don't think about. But what it is, is when gears are actually in mesh, it is this angle here, pressure angle, that forms between the line of action and what is known as the pitch line. And the pitch line is simply the tangent of the two pitch circles, and all the pitch circle is is the point of contact between the envelopes. So you've got a gear with a pitch circle, which is simply the, the midpoint of the envelope. And where the envelopes actually meet is known as the two pitch circles. That transition point creates known as a pitch line, sometimes called a pitch plane. Now, the angle between this pitch line and this line of action, where these two actually meet is known as that pressure angle and this is important the reason I'm going through all this with the pressure angle is because this dictates the direction and the composition of the forces that the gears act on each other with so it can actually and that ratio between the the, the different forces is dictated by that pressure angle so this can and this can actually play into an issue with the amount of pressure on your your drive shaft your axle your whatever component that this these gears are riding on 
so it actually can be a big factor in your gear design so so that pressure angle and that line of action are very very important again speaking of the line of action it's simply the straight uh, defined as the straight line passing through the pitch point and tangent to both base circles so here we have this area here which is just the pitch point and where that contacts is the line of action again that's dictated with that pressure angle or tied in with the pressure angle and that line and there we go the line of action now the pitch circle or the pitch diameter again that is you know the pitch circle is just the circle defined by the points of contact of the two meshing gears so where these come together you actually create the pitch circle now there's a lot more to this there's an addendum which is the top of the gear there's a dedendum which is the bottom of the gear you know there's the, the root and the fillet all these things are you know important but these are actually going to come up in a lot of our, our future calculations and they play a major part in gear design so when you design a gearing system these are the things that you're definitely going to end up touching on as well as some of the others but these these seem to to insinuate themselves all the way through gear design now when we look at those gear features and we can see the static picture we have here is another gif and we can see how these things actually play out so we have this blue line here that actually is our line of action if I just trace that over so you can see this is the line of action we've got our two pitch circles between the pinion and the gear which actually meet here and here and so this is the way that the pitch circles actually meet your line of action and one thing that's not shown on this picture is here is this pitch line now one important thing oh, that's not a very good picture but one thing that's important about this pitch line is that this is the area where the, the force actually travels through the gears so this is the force you know so that's the, where the force actually becomes tangent to the two gears where that pitch circle meets and actually transmits and causes the pinion or the gear to force the other gear to move so this is important and also one thing to get from this picture is if you notice the curvature of that gear tooth that's the involute shape and as this pitch line or this pitch point in the line of action transmits you can notice that it's a very tr smooth transition and that is because of the involute shape of the gear tooth so you can see all of these different things laid out again so this is your your involute this is the pitch plane or the pitch line so it's traveling through this this direction you got your pressure angle and here you got your your two pitch circles where they intersect so this is you know how the gear you know from the last uh, schematic how the the gear geometries and the gear features actually lay out and this picture here over on the left is just giving you a, a visual as to how these things actually interact in real life and you can see the, the benefit of that involute if, if these didn't have that involute shape it would be a much more jumpy much more abrupt transmission of power between the two and we'll get into to more on that but th just keep this in mind as we move forward so another feature of gears is you notice this is just two different gears hooked up and actually these are helical gears the rest of the gears have been spare gears and, and that's really what we're talking about but th this this gift will actually do if you look at these two gears one you we don't know which but one of them is actually driving and one of them actually is driven so one actually has power the other one is transmitting power and if you notice that they're moving in two opposite directions so one is moving clockwise which forces the other to move counterclockwise and this is just a common aspect of how gears are designed you know one gear moves comes into a mesh with the second gear and it pushes it into the opposite direction now the way to get around this is with a concept called an idler gear and one of the benefits of an idler gear is it forces the gears to change direction so if you have a, a scenario where you want two things going in uh, the same direction say if, if you have a motor that's going clockwise and you want an output that's also going clockwise what you can do is use an idler gear as a way of making this direction change to where you you want it to go another purpose of an idler gear is to help fill in gaps so you might need multiple idler gears and the benefit of an idler gear is it doesn't actually change the, the design of the system as far as the calculations go they actually fall out because you know they just take into a certain part of the the 
uh, gear train or the gear values and they just actually neutralize themselves as far as the calculation go but the, by able to change direction this is one of the great benefits of an idler gear and if you look at a manual transmission on a car or even a, an automatic transmission there is an idler gear that comes into play in order to make the the, uh, the transmission go from forward to reverse Another thing to think about or to keep in mind is the ability for gearing systems to go to take a rotary motion like from a motor and turn it into a linear motion and that is oftentimes done with a rack and pinion. So what you have is a pinion here which is actually powering the system and then you've got a rack that actually gives you a linear direction a left and right direction and a lot of your steering systems have this sort of a system in it. So you've got a gear system that actually can can give you a rotary motion from the steering wheel and it uses a rack or uh, tied into that pinion to give you a linear motion into your, your steering mechanism. Now another aspect of your, your gearing system is the idea of a compound gear. Now keep in mind you know you have gears that are uh, tied together which would be make them a compound gear. They have a, a common axis and when you keep that in mind you actually know that these two gears actually have the same angular velocity so let's put some numbers on these you got we'll call the bigger gear gear number one the second gear that's in tandem with it is gear number two and then you've got this gear the output gear we'll call that gear number three so gears number one and two have a common angular velocity meaning when gear number one takes goes around one revolution gear number two goes around the same revolution now because of their different diameters gear number one and two have completely different uh, tangential velocities so and that's one of the other benefits of a compound gear so if you have a certain velocity that you're trying to manipulate or a certain type of torque that you're trying to manipulate or a certain type of uh, speed uh, speed that you're trying to manipulate you can actually use compound gears in order to make a step down you know this is oftentimes when you have step down gears or step up gears multipliers sometimes they're called reduction gears uh, you're using compound gears and because of this difference in the two diameters you can actually step the tangential velocities up or down accordingly because the ratio stays constant so what you have here is you've got two gears on this compound gear that actually have a common angular velocity but proportionally different based on their radiuses or diameters tangential velocities here you have these two gears and we're just going to we're not going to make any assumptions on their diameters but they do have regardless of that a common tangential velocity same that you would see with this rack and pinion so that tangential velocity translates to the same tangential velocity here and this is still along the pitch line both of these are along their own pitch line now keeping that in mind this relationship between the velocity and the radiuses of the gears where one and two have a common angular velocity you know measured in rpm or revolutions per minute and they have a, a common ratio relationship between the tangential velocity and their respective radiuses. Now this is also another important concept to keep in mind when we actually go into further gear design. Now what this also tells you again is that the tangential velocity is common between gear 2 and 3. So keep this in mind that the differences in their tangential velocity is dictated by the differences in their radiuses which is going to have a very important impact in the future. Now, when you put all these together, you know, compound gears, idler gears, you're able to not only do a lot of manipulation in terms of stepping up and stepping down velocities and torques, you're able to keep the directions in, the, in the whatever desired output. So a series of gears and gear uh, values put together can actually give you the desired output and if you can shift these gears around much like in the transmission of your car you can end up getting a whole uh, array of different types of inputs and outputs that you would like so these can be very versatile and when you put these gears together in order to create this sort of this system you end up with another concept known as a gear train 
Now, speaking of gear trains and thinking of all those ratios between velocities and diameters and angular velocities, that gives us one new concept I want to bring up, which is a velocity ratio. Now, the velocity ratio is something that you can calculate between two meshing gears. Now, in this example, you can see you've got a gear, a bigger gear with 60 teeth and one that has half the number of teeth, so 30 teeth, uh, 30 tooth gear. The bigger tooth is the driver. The smaller gear is actually being driven. Now, because of these differences in their radiuses and in their number of teeth, you're going to get a very predictable output. So as you can see here, this smaller gear, this gear that's got half the diameter and half the teeth, is actually going to get twice the velocity of this bigger gear. That is what we think of when we think of a gear ratio, or excuse me, a velocity ratio. We identify that as VR. It is the ratio between the angular velocities of the pinion and the gear, or the radius between the pinion and the gear, or the number of teeth in the pinion and the gear, and they give you this very predictable calculation for setting up your, your velocity ratio. So if you know, or if you've decided on how big the gear you're going to uh, use, the type of teeth you're going to use, and the number of teeth that are going to be on there, you can actually calculate how much you're going to step the velocity of one gear up and step it when you are the other gear down. So that's a very important concept. So in this particular uh, gear setup, we have a velocity ratio of two. We're actually doubling the speed or the the angular velocity. You know, tangential speed is the same, but the angular velocity is different because of those two radiuses. And which leads us back to the whole idea of the pitch line, which is just the tangential velocity between the two gears. And you can see this is based on the radius and the angular velocity. Now, when you've got two or more gears, together you end up with what is known as a gear train. So now we can see we've got a gear train, you know, where we've got two gears in mesh here. You've got a compound gear between C and B. And then you've got an output gear at gear D. So you've got four gears, you know, two in mesh, or two sets in mesh, and putting these together, you end up with a gear train. So it's just two or more gears operating as a system. So that gives you another calculation that you can use, which is the train value, which is the ratio of the input speed of the first gear in the train to the output speed of the last gear in the train. And this is another a method you can use to design your gear train to get a desired effect. Now the way you would calculate this, or another way to calculate this, is the product of the different velocity ratios. Now remember the velocity ratios was two meshing gears. So in this case you'd have a velocity ratio for between gear A and gear B, and a velocity ratio between gear C and gear D. And the way you could calculate this based on the number of teeth or the different radiuses is just take the different velocity ratios and multiply them together and that gives you a train value. And once you know this train value, you can use this to understand what your system is going to do and you can actually manipulate it, you know, if you need to add teeth or a gear with more teeth or a gear with a different velocity or a different diameter and end up getting the output that you're desiring. Now, we do more than just try and change speeds with gears. Gears also are used to do a lot of mechanical work. You know, if you're going, you have a vehicle and you have a, a lot of heavy load, you might need to shift it to a lower gear. If you are on a surface and you need to get better traction, you might need to shift the gears in order to get more force. So it's not always about getting more speed out of the system. Sometimes you need to be able to transmit more torque throughout your system or less torque, which allows you to get a little more velocity out of the system. So again, looking at this schematic, a different schematic, you've got a pinion, a pinion and a gear, pinion and a gear, you've got a line of action, and along this line of action you can see you've got a force, and then you've got this WR and a WT, that was, excuse me, and you also have the pitch circle and the base circle, so this pitch circle, so all these things come into play, so this is where the teeth are actually connecting, and remember, it's this tangential force along the pitch line that actually forces one gear to move the other. So let's look at some of the forces that are going to be taking place here. The first force is this force that goes along the, the line of action. 
and that is what's known as known as the normal force it is normal to the involute of the tooth so it goes along that line of action and, and comes and intersects with the involute and it's normal to that involute and as all this is is the resultant between two more forces it's the resultant between this force which is the tangential force which goes along the pitch line and which is actually responsible for supplying the force that actually causes one gear to move the other then you've got a third force which is the radial force again this is actually works between the two axes this is actually the forcing the two gears to have a load between them actually it's it's literally pushing them apart now and this and here you have this normal force which is simply the resultant force between the two so you got the and you also have the pressure angle the pressure angle which will be here which is going to become part of the equation later so all of these things come into play with how you, the force is actually moved through the the system and again this is just showing you that the normal force is just a resultant between the tangential force and the radial force that acts between the two gears now the way these are calculated you can calculate each one of these the radial force is simply the tangential force times the tangent of that pressure angle and the normal force other than you know the you know right the sum of squares you can calculate that as that tangential force times the cosine of that pressure angle now how do you actually measure the tangential force again this is something that you know you can't go out and measure it you can't put a gauge on it so you need to calculate that too and the way to calculate that is with the torque you're putting into the system times the radius of the gear so if you have the torque times divided by the radius you can calculate what that tangential force is moving the system so think of it as calculating a moment the radius and the force being applied gives you a torque and the way you would calculate that torque is just simply you know doing a little bit of algebra so the the force times the radius and another way of getting that is if you know the power that you either need in the system or the power that you're imparting on the system with a, a particular motor times the torque and the rotational speed in this case it's defined as as n so so the rotational speed you can get the power so if you have a powerful the power on your motor and you know how much torque you're you're needing or you know how fast the system has to go you should be able to calculate the force that you're actually imparting between the gears your radial force and then your normal force and depending on the gears you bought you would know the pressure angle so this is the way you would actually calculate the force going throughout the system and once you've got that you can start designing things like your drive shaft because you'll be able to calculate your bending forces and the stresses that you're going to put on that shaft and this is how you start considering things like the material that you make the gear from because you're able to calculate all the forces that are taking place on this system including the gear now when you think about a gear system keep in mind everything is going through the teeth of the gear you know and not only it's going through the teeth of the gear but with the envelope that envelope it's actually between two radiuses two curved surfaces so it's actually coming in at a point so a lot of this force is coming in in a very specific place so that's a whole lot of force happening and creating a whole lot of potential failure so let's talk about this failure now what you have here is a finite element analysis of gears and mesh as you can see is you, if you ever know anything about a finite element analysis the red is actually showing you points of high stress on that gear and as you can notice it's actually the highest where the gear is actually contacted and also down here at the base or the root the fillet of the gear or get of the tooth so these are the high stress points and this is the areas where you're actually going to have potential for failure so what are these failures called the first point right where the teeth meet is called a contact stress and this contact stress again is it is a point where they can potential fail the failure will take place in the form of pitting and galling you know, because there's a lot of stress here where they're put together and at some point in time that entire system is dependent on this one point of engagement so it's important to understand you know what is going on there this could help dictate the size of the gears that you use the material you use as well as the heat treat 
you know heat treating is very important in gears so this is where you get a lot of gears where you're actually doing a lot of surface hardness because you want the gear to have a lot of toughness within but you want it to be very hard at its points of contact another for source of stress is down here at the at the fillet which is the bending stress and this is kind of intuitive as the gear is actually transmitting force and remember the tangential force is actually going across this way so this is what's making the gear move and as this is being pushed it's actually creating stress down here at the bottom because this is where it's going to want to bend hence the name bending stress and it's just the stress at the root of the gear here at the fillet where you can see a potential fracture and again this is another thing you keep in mind when you set up the gear and to do any of your your detailed designs as well as the design of your your drive shaft and any of your axles so this is professor cummings hoping that this was valuable to you in terms of an overview on gearing so we didn't go into you know a whole lot of details and there's a lot of different ways that gears can be designed a whole lot of different styles of gearing but at least this is an overview of the gearing and the things that actually play into your gear design and if this was helpful to you if you got anything out of this you can go ahead and and subscribe to to this channel or visit me on google plus and from there you can actually see how, how things are going to be up to date and any other you know engineering and manufacturing topics that i, I go over you'll get a, a first-hand uh, ability to, to see them and, and listen to them right off, off the bat all right thanks a lot and thanks for for listening